Do you want to know how to communicate better in a relationship? Then stick around, because in this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, I play guest on the Mindset of Steel, a live YouTube show hosted by Fernando Sosa. This was an online summit five-day relationship challenge, which I was invited to speak at last year. But you can still watch the replays from all the speakers by visiting www dot mindset of steel dot com slash relationship and if you would like my free check yourself checklist on better communication be sure to check out the link in the description below to get your copy hello thrivers and welcome back to the mht if you're just meeting me for the first time, my name is Patrick Martin, and I'm on a mission to help 1 million people improve their quality of life through actionable skills on personal development. So let's go. Welcome, everybody. My name is Fernando Sosa, and I am going to be the host of the five day relationship challenge. This is day number two of the relationship challenge. And uh, today we're going to hear from Patrick. Martin. I'm very excited to have him here. We have a, a slate of speakers uh, this week. Yesterday we had Rihanna Mill. Uh, today we have Patrick Martin. Rihanna is going to come again uh, tomorrow. And then we have Mohammed and then Mohammed Sheikh and then Sanya Barry. So these are all expert speakers. Uh, they have years of experience helping people uh, in relationships uh, and other areas of their lives. So today, I just want to give you a little bit of the logistics. If this is your first day attending, um, you should have gotten an email with a link to the to download the workbook. And uh, if for some reason you are in the challenge right now, but you uh, didn't sign up to the list, didn't sign up on the website because you were already part of the community, you're going to be missing out on the emails that go out that are event specific. So go ahead and go to mindsetofsteel.com slash relationship and just sign up there so you can be in the list and get these emails that are specific to this event, okay? The other thing is that um, we have this workbook and in the workbook, we have some challenges, right? So make sure that you get the the, work, the workbook and you follow follow uh, you know follow the speaker because there's some questions in the in the workbook. This is the workbook right here. Every day there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, the topic and there's some questions, fill in the blank questions. And the, the challenge of the day is in the workbook. So don't forget to take a look at that. And today we're going to have a special uh, handout as well, with the, which is a checklist that uh, I'm going to post in the Facebook group. And that's going to be part of your challenge. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about that later on, or Patrick is going to talk about that later on. Um, another thing is, you know, you still have chan a chance to invite other people to this challenge, right? We have a couple of days left. If they join, you can still watch the replay uh, up until Sunday. So you had an option to purchase the recording when you signed up. And, but if you didn't uh, get that option, you can still watch the replay during this week up until Sunday. Uh, so you can watch if you missed a day or two or, or something. You can you can re watch the replay in the group at any time. Okay, so if you if you invite somebody and they sign up, uh, they can still watch uh, yesterday and, and and whatever they miss. And um, that's all that I have for now. So what I'd like to do is uh, welcome Patrick. Now, Patrick, uh, let me welcome Patrick right here. Hello, Patrick. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good, good. How are you today, Patrick? I'm fantastic. Probably not as tired as everybody on the East Coast, but uh, <laughs> I, I applaud everybody for showing up because it's a big deal. It, it, is, it is a long day for me, uh, but we are excited to be here uh, and excited that you're here. Uh, so uh, people, if you're watching, don't forget to put your questions in the, in the, in the comment below. Ask your questions. And uh, I'm going to be in the back end, Patrick, just uh, supporting you and, and listening to any questions that come up, and I'll bring it up the screen. Do you want me to put the questions as you're speaking, or do you want to leave it to the Here, end? I'll take, I'll take them as they come. We have about an hour to play with, right? Yeah. So. Okay. So I'll be in the back end, and uh, anytime somebody asks a question, I'll, I'll pop it in the screen, and um, you know, I'll it's, it's all yours. So let's... Uh, Super. Let's, all right. Okay. So, all right. 
Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a privilege to be on the show. Thank you, Fernando, for the invite. And I hope that you all get value out of this. Um, the topic of communication is a really broad one. And since we're trying to apply that to relationships, I thought, you know, I put together some talking points that um, are kind of key takeaways, you know, stuff that I've learned and taught over the, you know, over a decade of being a counselor and a therapist, while this is not a therapeutic relationship or ther therapeutic training, it is definitely um, an opportunity to clean some information that I have learned in my personal and professional experience. So I put together what I thought would be relevant for you today. And um, I guess the the therapeutic term would be interpersonal effectiveness, when we're talking about relationships and points of intervention, and really when we're just trying to affect change and improve our quality of life inside the bubble of a relationship, right, inside that dynamic. Um, and so as we move forward with this, I just want to acknowledge, of course, that every relationship is unique, but, you know, not all communication is created equal, all right? Um, and so the, the points I'm going to try and cover in the time we have uh, tonight is the usual suspects, right, for problems and relationships, the things that usually trip us up, and also relationship pitfalls, right, which are not necessarily the usual suspects. They can be a little more stealthy. So we'll talk about that in terms of uh, obstacles, barriers, and I'd also like, like to talk to you about points of intervention, right? So through all the muck and mire, right, the work of the relationship, there are these points of intervention that we want to dive into for future implications, ways that we can improve the relationship in a way that has lasting, sustainable change. Um, and also, we want to touch on some general guidelines, right, um, in terms of communication, right, people skills, soft skills, as they say. Oh, I don't think they're very soft. I think it's underrated and, and not taught enough. You know, we've heard the term emotional intelligence, uh, effective communication, um, but really, these are subtle skills that make a huge different difference, right? So you've heard of small, small tweaks, giant peaks, right? It's the same idea. Um, and so the and then of course there's the more core communication strategies that are a little more meta, but we'll get into those a little bit, okay? And then at the end, I'll have a little homework for you guys um, to play with. All right. So <clears throat> I guess we'll start with the good news, which is that most behavior is predictable, right? That's good because if we can predict something, we can plan for something, right? And so that's what we're talking about today with the coping skills and communication skills. The bad news is that most behavior is predictable, right? Same thing. The problem with that is because when we make assumptions about behavior or somebody else's behavior, we oftentimes misjudge them or we actually plan our own responses based on their projected responses. Our partner, our other half, and this can be even be extrapolated to friendships or differentials like your boss, right? Any relationship, there's going, you know, the more experience you have in that relationship, the more likely you are to anticipate what that dynamic is going to look like in any played out scenario. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who plays out tapes in my head um, of hypothetical conversations, situations, right? It's a very human thing to do. It's an instinct. It's a way that we try and cope, right? And if it's not put in check, it can lead to certain types of anxiety, like anxious and anxious avoidance in relationships, right? Um, and so the, the whole idea of communication and behavior change, it's very mental, right? A lot of it is head work. Right. And in, in terms of how we envision the change we want, the things that play out. All right. So most behavior is predictable and we can use that as a pro or a con. All right. So to get us started, I do want to talk about the fact that, um, you know, it, interpersonal effectiveness is a life skill, but we can customize it to our individual relationships. Right. And it's very important when we talk about improving or changing the dynamic in a relationship that we are not strictly looking to change somebody else's behavior. Well, my relationship is fine on my end. If my partner would just, you know, get his stuff together or her stuff together, then this would be great. Life would be peachy and a bed of roses, but that's not generally how it works, right? We all 
play a part in the dynamic of relationships. And the reason this is good to acknowledge is because while we can't change other people directly, we can barely change ourselves, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but something as simple as learning to not bite your nails, simple concept, hard change, right? Um, but the good thing is that we can change other people's behavior by proxy. Now, I don't know how many of you out there play chess, but I like to use chess as an example. So let's say you've been playing chess with the same friend for 10, 20 years, right? You make a lot of moves, your opening moves, and probably your next 10, 15 moves without even thinking. It's just so automatic. And the reason for that is because you're so used to anticipating what the other person's move is. And it's not until you get to the thick of it that you really kind of start to have to think. Now, the, if we apply this to behavior, and I say, okay, so I've been playing chess with you for 20 years, but now I'm going to change the way that I, I open. Maybe I don't lead with my pawn. Maybe I lead with my knight, right? Or maybe I, I get my queen right out there, you know, and I usually would typically wait until the very end and reserve my queen. If I do something different than you expect, it's going to cause you to pause and really think about what's going on. It's going to almost jar you to a point to where you're going to have to think about why I'm doing something different and what that means to you. And so we kind of disrupt the pattern. And that's a big part of relationship change. If you talk to any couples counselor, they'll say pattern disruption, right? The, the problem pattern. If we can find a way to disrupt that in some sense, it's going to help change, change the theme, right? Of the arguments. All right, so let's talk about the usual suspects for a second. According to the National Center for Biotechnology, these are the top eight reasons for divorce or breakups, all right? The first of which is lack of commitment, okay? That's an obvious one. Infidelity, all right? There's another obvious one that infidelity makes up for about 60% of breakups, whereas lack of commitment is about 75, right? The third is too much conflict and arguing. So just too many frequent fights that it's just not worth the effort. At some point, people get tired when it's lopsided. It's like, okay, if it's like 80% good, 20% arguments, you know, we can work with that. But if it's the flavor of a relationship is bad most of the time, people just aren't willing to sustain that emotionally, right? Or mentally. Um, number four is getting married too young. Oftentimes, if people get married very young, it can create problems because people haven't really figured out what it is they want from life yet. And that can create what we call conflicting goals, right? Some people say, oh, we just grew apart. It's not really that people grow apart as much as that we're all changing all the time. And what we want in life changes as our schema gets bigger, as we understand the world differently or our values grow or change. And so we, we try and live a life that's congruent and if that's not in parallel with our partner's value system, that can collide. Okay. Um, big one, number five, and this is probably what I think is one of the more common ones, is financial problems. So money fights and money problems, right? Okay. Um, the uh, the sixth thing would be substance abuse. 34.6% of breakups are caused by substance abuse. Number seven, domestic violence actually only makes up for about 23.5% of breakups. And the interesting thing about domestic violence is it takes an average of leaving a domestic violent relationship seven times before somebody actually calls it quits. And we can take away from that too, that not all relationships are healthy to stay in. And so that's not the assumption. The assumption is quality of life, right? And learning to communicate more effectively. And number eight is health problems. Is, uh makes up for 18.2% of breakups. So that's some national data for you. Um, just think it's interesting to look at the statistics a little bit to get an idea of that. Okay. All right. Just checking the comments here for a second. Hmm. Okay. 
I don't quite understand the question. So we aren't listening to understand, but to respond. We'll get more into active listening. That's kind of the big takeaway from this is, is active listening. And then, of course, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to drop those and I'll answer those the best I can. Okay. Um, okay, so relationship pitfalls usually fall in one of three categories, right? So these aren't just the main reasons for breakups. The pitfalls, like I said, those things are a little more stealthy, right? They're things that we wouldn't necessarily see as a potential threat to a relationship, but they can certainly add to the stress of a relationship. The first of which is grief and loss. If one one person in the in the relationship is going through grief and loss, it can create all kinds of ambivalence and accusations, judgment into the relationship. Um, one example would be the death of a child. The death of a child can destroy most relationships. It can lead to blame, feelings of guilt, um, the inability to console one another. There's just so many reasons, right? that grief and loss can can cause ruin on a relationship but not just current loss but if we even think about past relationships and bringing the baggage from past relationships into current relationships it's easy for one person to compare their partner to a past partner and that's another form of grief and loss because they haven't accepted the loss of the past relationship they're actually holding their new relationship to a, a standard that isn't fair to that person because they weren't even a part of that equation and they're not the same person. So that's one form of how past grief and loss can be pulled into a new relationship. Role fluctuations. So this would include things like life changes. Take this pandemic, for instance. We've been going this, it'll be year next month. Um, it's caused a lot of role fluctuations. Families that weren't used to being together until 6 p.m., right, when everyone got home from work and school, are doing everything together. Parents are working in the home, trying to homeschool their kids. And this kind of role fluctuation causes us to wear multiple hats at the same time and can create things like role strain, right? And we have to find new ways to cope as a result. And so that can be a definite stressor on a relationship. Um, the third thing would be role disputes. These are your, um, your common arguments. Role disputes just means like, a disagreement, a grievance, a boundary violation, um, basically any fight. And the reason this is, you know, a stressor for the relationship is because fighting often comes a, becomes about fighting and not the actual problem. So it almost becomes like smoke and mirrors. If we're not careful, we just fight about the fighting. All right. So that's role disputes. And the last of which, like I'd mentioned previously, financial problems, right? And so not being on the same page financially can create all kinds of issues because as we know, finances are very tied to our emotions and our value system. And not everybody has the same value system around money. And that's not to say that everything has to be combined in a marriage or relationship, but being on the same page about how you're going to not just handle your current finances, but how are you going to dream together about the future, about retirement, about um, budgeting? You know, what does that mean? What kind of values? You know, if if you have kids, that changes the equation, you know, and what, th what things come first and what things come last, you know, and so quality of life versus saving. I mean, there's so many discussions to be had around it. And then, so financial problems, then we're in a crisis where there's so many, you know, a pandemic and people are becoming unemployed being on the same page you know so it, that's a big one as far as pitfalls for a relationship and not being on the same page early on when things are not so bad can create big problems later if there's a crisis okay yeah and so um cynthia asked best tips for balancing role shifts being stuck in the house now yes so <laughs> I think every home, depending on what you have to work with, is definitely going to have its um, unique solutions. Um, in my home, we converted what used to be our kids' playroom into a home office. That's where I'm at now. Um, but my wife works at the dining table, you know, with our 
with our uh, kindergartner and tries to do her work while homeschooling half the time. And then I'm trying to do that when she's gone uh, on site the other half of the time or less. Um, and that's very stressful. And so a lot of it is communicating with our kids, you know, and about what is what what we can and what we can't do and how they that we understand we're all in this together. The kids are having a hard time. Adults are having a hard time. And how can we weather the storm together and do it smart so we don't bite each other's head off? <laughs> you know, so kids don't internalize the stress or um, feeling rejected because they can't interrupt us every two seconds because they're not used to having their parents home. And so it becomes challenging. And <clears throat> communication, again, plays a big part in validating, validating our kids' concerns and needs and frustrations and also expressing our needs as parents in terms of how we how we are going to get through the day with structure and routine and when it's okay to interrupt us and when something can wait and that's not to mean that we don't value their questions but trying to handle things you know on the same page with our kids just like we would with our partner right and and knowing what what we what can give and what can't okay all right um, so some general, uh, ideas in terms of points of intervention, right? So points of intervention, if you haven't heard of that term, are basically places where we can get a foothold to disrupt the pattern, right? So the first intervention, point of intervention, would be how we view the other person, right? And so in, in counseling, we talk about the emotional mind, we talk about the logical mind and kind of where they meet in the middle is the wise mind. So we're not neglecting the emotion that goes back to like, yeah, we don't want to invalidate our partner or our children, but at the same time, logically we know what has to be done. So the wise mind says, how can I express the logic in a way that's emotionally validating? And so to do that, we need to see the situation in a lens from a larger perspective as opposed to just being in the moment emotionally. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, but that's one point of intervention, is stepping outside of our present emotion and looking at the situation more objectively. And sometimes that means taking a time out <laughs> and stepping away, getting some fresh air, going in the backyard, front yard, the car, whatever you have, to get a few minutes <clears throat> of peace so you can collect your emotions and your thoughts before you react. All right. Uh, intervention number two is we can think about the problem, right, as a problem and not the person. Um, in the words of Jack Sparrow, for those uh, Pirates of the Caribbean fans out there, um, I believe he said the, you know, the problem is the way we think about the problem, not the problem itself. So oftentimes we tack things on to a problem that aren't even part of the equation. And we're thinking about it as something much bigger than it is. Whereas if we stop looking at the problem as being attached to someone else or something else, and we just look at it objectively together, it's much easier to problem solve if we treat it as a separate thing than ourselves or the relationship. All right, and intervention number three would be obviously how we behave in the response to a problem, right? It takes two to tango in that sense that we only have control over our reactions. We can't necessarily control what other people say or do to us and their emotional states, right? All we can do is control our physical reactions, right? And sometimes that means saying nothing at all, right? Sometimes that means taking it, you know, waiting it out or reflecting before we respond. All right. Are we good? I'm going to talk about some general guidelines next. All right. So some general guidelines right, for communication. Now, because again, I'm, we have to be very general here because this, <clears throat> this challenge is not specifically for one type of problem or one type of relationship. It's important that we think about, again, some general guidelines that can be applied to wherever you are in your walk of life, because everybody watching this may not be in a relationship. Maybe they are trying to plan ahead and say, you know, in my next relationship, I want to do better. I want to be better. You know, I want to, I want to not make the same mistakes. It could be that you're in a, you know, in a moving from a committed relationship toward marriage or something to a higher level, and you want to kind of know how to level up. It could be that you've been in a committed relationship for many years, and um, you just want to kind of do some fine tuning. 
or you're having a lot of arguments and you want to you want to know how to lessen that right so these are the guidelines i would like to share with you and cynthia asks any great ways teen uh, to get teenagers to be more effective i have a question patrick sure Oh, uh, we have a question. I think Rosemary wants to actually, Rosemary, you want to go ahead and sh go ahead and ask your question? Go oh. for it. Um, so I, I think it's great. And I love the fact that you're kind of um, tailoring this to not just um, couples, even mm -hmm. singles. So I, I really appreciate that. But sure. um, kind of going back, uh, mm -hmm. not that I haven't been listening, but this is, it was my question and I asked it. And you had said, you said that you wanted to kind of yeah, please keep the I'll... questions rolling as they went. But um, those early assumptions uh -huh. um, in an argument can those be misconstrued as a form of fog lighting, or is it indeed a form of fog lighting your spouse or your significant or your friend? Or I don't think people mean to make faulty assumptions. I think it's automatic. Like it's know, a and, and toward the end of the, the communication strategies, I'm going to talk about rules and assumptions. And as a cognitive behavioral therapist, this is really at the core of behavior change, right? Because core beliefs are formulated from an early age. And every real every relationship we have from childhood to adulthood reinforces or challenges those that belief system. And assumptions. And so you have to think about rules and assumptions are actually derived from core beliefs, right? So if I have a core belief that the world is a dangerous place, let's say I grew up in a domestic violent home, right? And my mom, my dad was beating on my mom and I had to go hide under the bed. That was a safe thing to do, right? Because I maybe I tried to stop him one day and I got beat too, right? Theoretically. Right. So if I climb under the bed, I learn this is safe. And so that works as a child. But as you get older, if you continue to operate off that belief system, that avoidance feels safe whenever, whenever there's conflict, what you're going to end up having is a passive communication style. And so your rule would be when there's conflict, I back away, I withdraw, I get smaller, right? Because the assumption is if I try to take proactive action, I get hurt. I get hurt. Right. Yeah. And so I don't think people mean to blow smoke with their assumptions. I just think that assumptions are hard to challenge because they're so deeply rooted in our personal experience. Mm -hmm. So we're really the point of intervention is the rules that, that protect the assumptions, right? Because it'll change. Like one person, you know, my rule might be I smile to everyone at the checkout at the market, right? Because my assumption is they appreciate that because most people don't. And that my assumption might be that most people are well-intended, which translates to very different behavior than somebody who feels like most people have an agenda and it's very selfish and everyone's out to get you. <laughs> you know? um, but our global assumptions and rules, it, they, they trickle in and filter into our interpersonal relationships. Right. And we may we may give those who are closest to us a lot more wiggle room, a lot more leeway. Right. And how we treat them and how we allow them to treat us. But when push comes to shove and our um, our self-esteem is wounded, for example, or there's a loss. Right. Or if we feel misunderstood, oftentimes we when we get defensive, our rules and assumptions flare up. Right. To protect ourselves. Yeah. And some people get bigger. They get angry. Some people get very passive and withdrawn, right? And so the goal is to find a happy medium, right? And in, in therapy, we call that aggressive communication, passive aggressive and assertive and passive. The goal is assertive communication. And so the way we cut through that, you know, the fog, the smoke and mirrors, oftentimes that are unintended, the fighting about the fighting, right? Right. We're, we learn to state our feelings without being accusatory of the other person. And we also find ways to state our needs, right? Without making the other person defensive. Because I don't know about you, but as soon as I feel defensive, I'm not taking any risks. I, you know. okay, okay. it's like, what is it, fight or flight? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a defense, that's a defense mechanism, yeah. 
All right. Well, yeah. all right. Thanks. That's that's. I don't have to answer the question. No, you certainly have any great. No. So Ooh. Cynthia asks, any great ways to get teenagers to be more reflective? <laughs> reflective about their own behavior? If that's the case, depends on the teenager. Because there's a lot of change that goes on between, say, 13 and 19. In terms of your schema, right? Your ability to really that higher level functioning to be able to reflect on your own behavior. You have to understand that children and teenagers live very much in the present, whereas adults tend to have one foot in the past ruminating and regret and one foot in the future, future tripping, right? Anxious about, you know, 10 years from now. But children and teenagers have this amazing ability to be present. Time moves very, very slowly for them. Today is it. That's all, it's hard for them to think past today. And so if one thing we can do to get them to be more reflective is to help them think about things that are important to them and how their current decisions or past decisions are impacting what's important to them now, not five years from now or 10 years from now. And that's a hard thing to do, you know, for a teenager. But the worst thing we can do is, is shame them, guilt them, and put them on the defensive. Um, so there's that saying, don't teach a child what not to do. Teach a child what to do. But more importantly, why? Right? To have, and not and not only talk about these things when we think it's relevant, but to find, you know, teachable moments all the time. And get in the habit of just having kind of free conversation with them about how the world works. And they will come up with their own questions and they'll start asking you questions that they didn't before because now there's more frequency in terms of their critical thinking as opposed to just having pointed lectures anytime that they violate a rule in the home or a boundary or do something wrong because then it's very punitive and then that puts them on the defensive, right? And it's, it's restrictive. We want to have as more free, free thought about these things when it's not related to any kind of offense. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. All right. So some general guidelines are the why, the where, and the how. Okay. So step one, you know, when we're talking about seeking change in a relationship or, you know, growing, being better and our communication is to identify the relationship goals. Now I had mentioned it depends on your life situation, your status, the relationship, um, and your goals will be different. You know, I want to, you know, I want to be a good communicator when I get married, you know, or, you know, I would like to talk, learn how to talk to my, my husband about, you know, disciplining the kids because we seem to be on a different page, very different goal, right? But that's the why. That's what we want to keep in front of us. You know, why are we desiring to make a change in the first place? Okay. And this could be, you know, projecting your ideals about the relationship and priming your mind for the change that you want to see, right? As opposed to the thing that you're unhappy with. Um, this could be for the single person, dating person, looking to get serious or to repair or elevate a relationship. Thing number two would be to identify the target behavior. So if you've identified a goal, something you want to change in a relationship or improve upon, now we have to find out what's the target behavior we're trying to change that's getting in the way of growing or accomplishing that goal, right? Because there's, there's specific blocks our behavior puts up. And if we can figure out what that behavior is, Sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes it's not. Maybe every time you get afraid, you bite off the head of your partner. <laughs> and, you know, that's a little more obvious, right? But um, figuring out what the specific behavior is and how that's affecting the goal or slowing progress, right? This could be things like um, overgeneralizing or aggressive communication or passive communication or wound collecting, right? That could be a problem behavior. Right. Um, meaning that you're keeping score. Right? You've heard that term like you keep bringing up the past, you know, of all these things I did wrong. I said I was sorry. You know, a wound collector, you know, that's a habit of holding on to all of your offenses and then 
containing and then unloading, right? When you become emotional. And so that can become a serious uh, blockade, right? And then withholding affection, right? That could be a, uh, a problem behavior that gets in the way of effective communication or progress toward your goals in a relationship. So withholding affection is not effective. You know, it actually causes the other person to, to withdraw. Okay. And this, you know, can speak directly to the change that we desire, you know, about the defined problem. All right. Step three, right? This is the, the last step of the general guidelines is to operationalize the desired change. So operationalize just means the how. All right. So we've identified the goal. We've singled out the, the problem behaviors. Now we have to do what's called goal pacing. Now we have to find a way to make that behavior work in an implementation. How do we apply this change to our life? So that's called operationalizing the change or the goal, right? Specific things. That could be something like keeping a gratitude journal of your partner or keeping a gratitude journal for each other, right? That's an operational change. That's an actionable thing you do and you commit to on a regular basis. Okay. All right. Are we all good? Any more questions before we move on? I'm going to talk about communication strategies next. Hmm. Any ways to get teenagers to be more reflective? Yeah, um, we've just spoken to that. So that's, again, um, not just encouraging them to reflect on their behavior when, when, it's, when you're lecturing or disciplining or they're in trouble, but encouraging them to be reflective when times are good, right, on a regular basis. Open the conversation that causes them to reflect. So one way is to ask open-ended questions, not closed-ended questions. You know, how was your day? Good. Fine. Bad. You know, um, an open-ended question would be, what was the best part of your day? Because that forces them away from a yes or a no or a single response. It causes them to have to give you um, an elaborate, comprehensive response. And so if you as a parent can focus on asking a lot of open-ended questions when you have downtime with your, your teenager, that will help them become more reflective because it, act, it forces them to access that part of their brain that has to really um, process what their day has been like, as opposed to a stock response. This is why in therapy, we use something called mood tracking. It forces people to actually journal what's going on during the week so that otherwise, when they get to therapy, they, you ask them, so what's going on this week? Not much. Until you get halfway into session and they thought, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, my dog died. Oh, and, you know, I got I got written up at work. Well, a lot happened during the week, right? But because they weren't processing it during the week, they failed to bring it up. It's the same kind of idea. I don't know if that was helpful, but open-ended questions. Um, and if you can encourage your teenager to do any kind of mood tracking or journaling, that can be very helpful. There's a free app um, called Dailyo, Dailyo that makes it really easy. You just use emojis to track your mood, and then you can customize the colors and you can make, take notes. And that's a great way to reflect and just teach your kids how to be mindful of what's going on emotionally. So I don't know if that helps. Okay. So uh, communication strategies. Um, the first thing, and this is what, these are some of your fill-ins for your workbook intent. All right, the first thing is I want you to keep in mind that contentment is not complacency. Right, you've heard of the seven-year itch. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's actually a thing. It was a movie, right? The seven-year itch, right? Um, it's easy to become comfortable in a relationship with the routine, but we don't. And it's important, mind you, to be comfortable and content, whether you have money or don't have money, or have children or don't have children, whatever the circumstance. Right? All we need is love. Right? It's important to understand the value of being content and not having a lot of things contingent on your happiness other than your partner, right? Um, but we don't want to be complacent, right? Because complacent is the death of change. Complacency means that 
we no longer have any desire for dif- for growth, personal development. Um, so it's important in this sense that we learn to dream together, right? That you continue to try and court your partner, that you pursue your partner, right? That doesn't stop after marriage, that continues on. And a big part of this is doing things to be mindful of what you appreciate about your partner and then finding ways to express that, right? Not just on Valentine's Day. All right. Super. I'm glad. Awesome. Open-ended questions and journaling. You have three girls over it all, so we'll use these two. Too. Yes, I have two girls, and they're both artistic, so that's another thing to use. Use their strengths right? Use their strengths. So my girls like art. So something I try and do is have my children express through art, oftentimes how they're feeling. You know, art therapy is a very powerful, very powerful. Okay. Um, Music too. Music is very powerful. So having your children explain things to you, that's important. My 12 year old is all of a sudden, I was wondering when it would happen, but now all of a sudden she's into music, right? So it's a great opportunity to not just tune them out when they're listening to their music, but we give her the option, you know, we let her play DJ with the phone on Pandora, you know, and the, the speaker, but then ask her, you know, oh, what do you like about that song? Or who's your favorite artist right now? And then suddenly a child who was never really engaged that much in conversation suddenly wants to ask you who your favorite artist is and why you what music you listen to because that's what's relevant to them so figure out what's relevant to your kid find ways to empower them with that and then get feedback right then you'll have the exchange all right so um the next strategy for communication is to watch your contingency thinking Contingency thinking is the catalyst for anxiety. I'm just going to say that. I call it stinking thinking, contingency thinking. You've heard of the the old app, if this, then that. That's what that is. It's saying, I will do this when that happens. I will stop withholding affection from my husband when he learns to take out the trash. (laughs) It's contingencies and ultimatums that we give people in our head But don't communicate those ultimatums even. It's kind of like this, well, when they show that they're serious, then I'll get serious. I'm tired of pulling all the weight, right? It's that contingency thinking. And we don't when we don't process that openly, it's very unfair to our partners. Okay. Um, The next strategy is to understand that beliefs are solidified by emotionally reinforced impressions right? These are patterns that verify fears and assumptions, right? So the trick is to learn to catch our thoughts, right? Our assumptions, and then to challenge them for validity, saying, oh, I just had this thought about my partner, but is that true? Is that only true in this context? Is it true about their character in general? So we don't make the mistake of overgeneralizing, our viewpoints, because then what happens is then we speak emotionally to that belief, even though that belief is fleeting, meaning as soon as we calm down, we don't really think that anymore. So we need to be careful because we can't take words back. Okay. So if we want meaningful, lasting change, it has to be change that has an impact on the exchange and quality of the relationship. All right. And so Real change actually occurs through pattern disruption. And this is kind of, if you talk to any, you know, hardcore couples, counselor, family therapist, they'll tell you that pattern disruption is the goal. And they will use some pretty interesting ways to get couples to um, to take note of that, right? Some Some therapists will use paradoxical homework they'll actually say, well, why don't you just get divorced then? Why go through all this trouble? And that'll force the couple to come up with reasons why they shouldn't get divorced, right? It's very paradoxical. It actually, it's like reverse psychology. Um, that's a pattern disruption. Uh, one therapist might tell a couple to, you know, sing out the words when they're upset, right? Because then it makes the argument comical and then it loses its power right? Because they start laughing at each other every time they have to sing when they're when they're arguing, <laughs> you know, and make it a musical. So these are ways you can pattern disrupt. Um, but the idea is to break the cycle, right? 
because oftentimes we're making mountains out of molehills and it's really just a poor investment of your time in the relationship to argue. All right. <clears throat> so this is a big one. Seek to understand before being understood, right? Another way to say this is to seek understanding versus blame, right? If, if I want you to understand me and my offense, it's really important for me then to first understand how you see the situation, how you feel about the situation, and if we're even on the same page. You might have offended me, and I was the last thing on your mind. It wasn't even directed at me. I just internalized it. I just made it about me, and it maybe wasn't. And so, or maybe I offended you first, and you did something out of spite to me, but I didn't know I offended you. So if we don't stop and pause and try and figure out what is going on in the other person's head, we're going to jump to conclusions. And then I'm going to be mad and resentful at you because you didn't want to hear what I had to say, or I feel misunderstood, right? Seek understanding before being understood. Okay, that's a big one. All right. So the next big one, and the next couple are pretty big. Yes, power of the pause. That's right. You know, quick to listen, slow to speak, two ears, one mouth, right? <laughs> I love that. Um, so active listening is both verbal and nonverbal, right? Active listening is both verbal and nonverbal. And active listening is the ability to communicate. As we know, most, the majority of communication is nonverbal with our body language that we're paying attention that we, somebody has our undivided attention. And yes, eye contact is good. Nodding is good. You know, not being distracted, not watching the TV. And I don't know what it is about TVs, but if there's a TV on the room, any motion, I'm like, so, you know, turn the TV off if you're talking or talk in a different room, go to the kitchen, put your phone upside down, right? Active listening, all of those things send signals to your partner that you're paying attention, right? When I sit at the dinner table with my family, my phone goes behind me and upside down, right? Not because I can't listen to them and, you know, scroll through my social media. It's because I'm trying to set an example that I'm and modeling that I'm paying attention. And that goes a long way. And, you you know, there's a saying with children, especially that more is caught than taught, right? More is caught than taught, meaning they pick up on more than they you think they do. And most of that's by example. All right. Um, so that's a big part of active listening. Body language, proximity, getting closer to someone when appropriate, physical contact. Um, and then, of course, the verbal communication, the mm-hmm, uh-huh. And making it a point, if somebody's talking and talking and talking, and it's like more than 30 seconds, it's okay to interrupt them and say, hey, you know, I just want to be clear, I understand what you just said. Or I want to provide a little feedback. Or I want to, to get clarification. Sometimes that's called parroting. You want to rephrase, paraphrase back to the your partner what they just told you. Because that's actually very flattering. Because that tells them, hey, I really want to know what you're telling me here. I want to make sure I understand your thought process. And then let them continue. And you do that about every 30 seconds. Especially if they tend to talk without pausing. You force the pause to make sure you understand. And then when you feel like you have enough information, you want to provide meaningful feedback, like a unique thought, authentic thought, not just what they told you. Because usually if a partner is sharing with something with you, it's either to vent or because they actually want your feedback. And it's okay to ask, hey, babe, do you just want to vent? Or do you actually want want to hear my mind on on this? And not in a, not in a um, play, you know, placative way, but in a way that, hey, you know, I really, I really want to support you the best I can, right? So active listening is not, it's called active because it's, it takes work, you know, to be fully present with someone. And um, I'm a therapist and I give people undivided attention, you know, one-on-one -on -one for 10, 15 hours straight, you know, on a day. Um, but, when, you know, if I'm talking to my wife and I've got kids in the room and she's trying to talk to me about something important, I'm like, I can feel myself like trying to follow because my head's swimming with other things. And it's because I don't have that protected space. 
And so oftentimes we, and I'm guilty and she can see my eyes gloss over. I get distracted, you know, she calls me on it. She's like, what did I just say? I'm like, uh, got me, <laughs> I was like, you know? Um, so it's important to, um, create protected space, especially if you see that your partner is trying to share something with you meaningful, not necessarily like crisis, like there's a fire seriousness, but if it's something that you can tell by their affect is important to them or they're passionate about, or even if it's just to gossip about something they find interesting, protect that time. If your kid's trying to interrupt you, model for them and say, you know, mommy's talking to me right now or daddy's talking to me right now. I, um, I'll give you my attention in a minute, but I want to finish this conversation. It's, it's also showing your kids the importance of undivided attention. Okay. And do the same thing with them. You know, if you committed to playing with your kid, you know, on Roblox or something on their iPad, you know, be sure to, um, you know, even if your wife is trying to talk to you, say, you know, I really want to talk to you, honey. I promised, I promised her a little one here. I'd give him 10 minutes, you know, of my attention. So I want to make sure that I do that, you know, and be consistent on both ends. All right. So a couple more things. Um, usually if there is anger coming from one person or both people in a relationship, it's important to find the fear because almost always, I guarantee you, anger stems from fear. When people get angry, it's because they're afraid. They're afraid of loss. They're afraid of something bad happening that they have gone a million miles in their head and they've projected the worst possible case scenario. And then they're kind of venting to you, not because they necessarily want to be mad at you. They're mad of what they're afraid of. And your role in that, something you did or failed to do that contributed to that fear, right? So it's your job, my job to figure out what that is and own up to it if we contributed to a possible problem. Or say, oh, I can see why you're afraid of that, but that's not the most likely thing to happen. This is what I can do to help correct that, you know, and do some problem solving, some reality testing, and they'll come back down most of the time. Okay. All right. And assertive communication. This is a big one. We could talk for hours about this, but assertiveness this is a fill-in. Assertiveness is defined by the ability to accurately communicate your thoughts and feelings, positive or negative, truthfully, with a relaxed demeanor, and with respect to the other person. This is hard. Assertive communication is so hard because when we're emotional, we lose this rational capability to just talk to the offense or the problem. Right. We get we're so entrenched or enmeshed emotionally with the situation that we have a hard time being assertive. We end up becoming aggressive. Or if you're like me, who tends to be a passive person to begin with, if as you're learning to be more assertive, it's easy to overcorrect and become more aggressive, you know, when you're trying to get a point across. So understand it's a, we're all a work in progress. Nobody's perfect. And communication is a lifelong skill. It's something we continue to tweak. And guess what? It changes with every relationship. The so the core skills of communication don't change. But when we bring somebody else into the equation, guess what? It changes. The rules change a little bit because we have to learn this other person's pattern. We have to learn their pet peeves. We have to learn about their fears. We have to learn about timing, right? You've heard that, that phrase, you know, when is it best When's the best time to say something, right? When it's timely, when it's helpful, when it's necessary, right? And when it builds the other person up, right? And it's not always a good time. I could have something really important I want to share with you. But if I come to you when you're already not in a good space and you're stressed out and I come to share my epiphany of my life dream with you, and then you basically ignore me, reject me, or tell me <laughs> you know, that, you know, yeah, okay. I'm going to feel like, oh, my partner doesn't even care about my my passion, you know, but that's not the case. We just had really bad timing, right? So timing is important, right? And not everything needs to be said if it's not helpful, right? What's that old saying from grandma? If it's not helpful, you don't have anything nice to say. Don't say anything at all. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, there's a phrase I love 
iron sharpens iron, right? I have that engraved on my wedding ring. Can't really see it. Um, this comes from the Bible, Proverbs 27, 17. Whether they're religious or not, I like the phrase because it speaks to at least the Western idea of what a relationship is about, right? It's about building each other up, being better together than you are individually, right? Making each other better on a constant basis. And the whole idea that a relationship is 50-50, it's kind of hogwash. You know, it's never going to be exactly the same. There's going to be times when, you know, one person is more stable emotionally and mentally than the other person. They have more to give. And there's going to be times when you have to support your partner more for their goals. And then in turn, they support you more at a different season of your life for your goals. And that's just how a relationship works. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. But it doesn't mean it's unidirectional all the time. Okay. Um. All right. And it's important to maintain an attitude of gratitude, right? To be proactive and identifying daily exceptions to our complaints. So rather than complain that your, you know, your husband doesn't take out the trash all the time or your wife doesn't, you know, do this or that or the other. Um, when you ask maybe a thousand times, right? Um, focus when you, when you feel that rise within you and you have that thought, catch that thought and then turn your mind to something you really appreciate about that person, right? Something that they do very well, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so it's important to find exceptions to our complaints. That doesn't mean that we're going to sugarcoat our complaint and say, oh yeah, you know, I love the way he just leaves his used tissues all over the house. That's me. Or his half, half drink water bottles like this. Um, rather, it's being honest about the things, okay, that could use work, but then balancing that out with the things we appreciate about the other person, right? Which is why we're with them, right? So there should be some stuff you can dig up. All right. And then lastly, and this one's a big one, consider what you are, what are your relationship assumptions and rules, right? Um, we all have rules, rules that dictate our behavior within relationships. My rules may differ from your rules, and some rules are more helpful than others. Some are just debilitating, okay? Um, but like all rules, rules stem from assumptions and how we believe the world around us works, how it operates. And those assumptions that we have stem from our core beliefs, like we were talking about earlier. And core beliefs are developed from our early life experiences. So the good news is we get to reparent ourselves anytime. We can change our rules when the rules no longer work. We can tweak the rules when they're no longer effective, right? If I feel like when my partner gets upset with me, the safest thing to do is to say nothing at all until she comes down and then not bring it up again. <laughs> right? That might be my rule, but then I might experiment and say, hmm, I wonder what would happen if instead of shying away, I maybe didn't chase chase it down, but I asked for some, you know, I explored a little bit about where the frustration's coming from, about maybe what I said, what thought that triggered, or what was it specifically? Because the more tangible we can get with something, then the more we can try it again and reapply it and reapply it and make a, an educated decision about those rules and say, well, rule A got me here. Okay, rule B, we played with that a little bit. You know what? It had a little bit better outcome. So I can tweak that. I can replace that rule with this one. It's not like a one foul swoop thing where we just change our entire rule book to life. We're just finding small tweaks, right? Small tweaks and because it's going to change in every relationship you have. The rules will change. And this is why relationship problems are the number one cause for, you know, for people who have quality of life issues because the rules change all the time. And that's not fun, but it's a big part of life. And so that's why these skills are really helpful because we can take the, the foundation, but then we can apply it differently to each relationship. Um, I was a sociology major in undergrad and um, there was 
a theory I really liked. It was called stage theory. And the whole idea is that, you know, if, if we get to know someone well enough, they'll invite us to their backstage. But we have to under we have it has to be done in a safe way um, that they then allow us to understand what their fears are, what their rule system is, why they have the rules that they have, the home they grew up in, the parents they had, their past pains and hurts. And the more the better we get to understand those things, the more compassion we'll have for their reactions that we're not so happy with. And the more we can actually work to to elicit change from them, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully it does. Okay. Um, so a little homework, and then we'll take some more questions if you have any. We have a few minutes left. Um, I would have you check out the checklist I created on active listening. I think Fernando is going to post that for you. If not, you can head over to my website at thementalhealthtoolbox.com and then just shoot me an email on the contact me page and I'll email you the, the fillable PDF. Okay. Um, I would also have you, I have some videos on my YouTube channel, one of which is on communication skills. So I would have you check that out. It's about 37 minutes. And it goes through a lot of what I just talked about, just some highlights of effective communication. Um, you can check that out on my YouTube channel. You can get to that um, just on YouTube, the Mental Health Toolbox, or you can go to my website and just um, all the links are right there on the front page. Okay. Um, and some other considerations I would have you have, you know, to uh, consider what your rules and assumptions are, right? When you think about why you do what you do, think about the rationale. You know, when did I learn this? When did this become relevant? Why did I start doing things this way? And see if it still makes sense, okay? Another thing you can do is to think about your negotiables and non-negotiables. When I'm talking to clients about relationships, this is a big one, right? Because there's lots of things we can compromise on. But if we don't know what our negotiables and non-negotiables are, our boundaries, right? This puts you at risk for codependence, meaning that you have no boundaries, right? Or you don't know where your boundaries are, meaning that you will always adapt and conform to make your partner happy. And that defeats the purpose of a relationship, right? The first thing they tell you when you get married, don't lose your individuality. Your partner didn't want to marry themselves. They married you or they got together with you or they choose to date you. So if it's normal in a relationship to have some blending, right, of mannerisms, thought process. But if you completely conform to the other person, you're not doing them a service, you're doing them a disservice. So understand where your boundaries are and don't neglect your self-care and what's important to you and your goals and dreams for the sake of the relationship, because that will actually be the demise of the relationship. Okay. Um, consider your life experiences. Right? What experiences contributed to the most current rules that you have? Right? I would also have you consider um, how these rules were identified right? to protect you. Right, If you already know, that's good. And then start practicing active listening. Right, Do it with a safe person. It doesn't have to be a partner. It could be a friend. You can do some role playing even. And a good way to do this is um, you could ask a friend to share, to talk for five minutes about something they care about, sports, cars, fishing, um, their, the last book they read, um, and see how you do with your, act, with your active listening, um, and then try and repeat back five highlights of what they shared, right? So that's about one highlight a minute. Shouldn't be too hard. But that's a great way to kind of practice and then ask for their feedback. Say, how was I doing? Did I did it seem like I was listening? What was it in my my mannerism, my affect, my body language that told you I was engaged? If you have a hard time kind of assessing yourself, it's a fun little experiment you can do with friends and kind of see what what comes up because you'll see how hard it is to actually follow somebody for an extended period of time and then pair it back or or confirm what they told you, right? All right. So, I hope that was helpful. That's all I have for you today. So, that was right about an hour. So that's good. Um, any last questions, concerns? That was awesome, Patrick. Thank uh, you. The yeah, I don't see any more questions here. But that that was very awesome. I just posted the the, the checklist uh, inside Super. the Facebook group. And uh -huh. everybody listening, everybody watching, 
you can check out Patrick's Patrick's website with other links uh, and other resources that he has there. And uh, appreciate you, Patrick, for being here. Before we end, I wanted to uh, give away. Uh, we're giving away every day based on uh, user engagement. Uh, today, we're going to give away this book uh, called Love Letters, uh, Moving On and Growing Up. And I'm going to just pick a random. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to Cynthia. Cynthia, you were Yay. very nice today. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, congratulations. I'll be in touch to send you this book. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. My for pleasure. Time. And we are going to keep on monitoring the questions. Uh, and um, Patrick will, you know, can follow up with questions that, that you post. And just a uh, um, final word, just appreciate you again. This is a lot of nuggets, like, th like Cynthia said, a lot of interesting things, uh, uh, communication skills uh, related. And the worksheet uh, was, was very good. I was following and, and writing down awesome. the answer. <laughs> it was a good, uh, a good exercise. Um, so challenge number two is on the workbook. Uh, you can practice active listening skills. And you can watch this video that the link is on the is on the workbook that you can watch uh, the video that is by Patrick. And um, that's your challenge, challenge, challenge number two. OK, uh, let me see. Final. I have a comment here. Uh, who is this? Thank you, Patrick. OK, that's Sonia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that's about it. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I'm going to leave. Uh, leave the screen here, but thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Tomorrow, day three of the Relationship Challenge. All right. Take care, Patrick. Awesome. Thank, you. thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Another tool to help you thrive. And if you would like your free Check Yourself checklist on better communication, be sure to visit the link in the description below. And if you're getting value from this content, be sure to like, subscribe, and share if you haven't already. Now go make good things happen. Bye-bye now.